we were at Joshua chapter 21 last week and we had talked about looking at the Katif Kare reading there of Golan and we had gone down to the textual apparatus we'd located that superscript A and then we had looked at the symbols and then we had converted those symbols into the statement that you see up here on the screen in the blue box down at the bottom. Now that's what you want to do with your textual critical apparatus assignment. You want to take the symbols, you will record the symbols in one column just as I gave you in the syllabus in the study notes on pages 116 and 117. You have one column with the verse reference. The next column has the text, the Hebrew text from the body of the text. The third column has the Masora Parva when you're doing the Masora Parva. It has the TCA or text critical apparatus when you're doing that. And then the meaning is the final column on the right. And this, what's in the blue box here, is the meaning of the text critical apparatus. And all it is is just converting that into plain English using the tools that you have, using Scott, using Bratzman. You should be pretty much through Bratzman by now in your reading, up uh, around 100 pages or more should be completed in Bratzman. And then you also have the preface to your Hebrew Bible. And there are a number of other sources on the Masora Parva, uh, Kelly, Minot, and uh, Crawford is a source that I mentioned to you last time. And then also, in addition to that, there are a large number of books on textual criticism of the Old Testament in the library. Uh, Emmanuel Tove has three editions of his work. This is the third edition that just came out. We have all three editions in the library in multiple copies for, uh, I think, the first and second edition. Plus, we have uh, many other men's works in the library. We have Ernst Wertwein's work on textual criticism. Uh, every major uh, theological dictionary or biblical dictionary or encyclopedia has articles on textual criticism. So the Anchor Bible Dictionary under textual criticism will include tables of abbreviations and symbols and things of that nature. Uh, so there's lots and lots of material available in the library from a wide range of sources to help you on this getting paper number three completed. And then you have an additional resource and that's your professor. Uh, as busy as I am, I still try to get to the emails and try to give a response. If you send me an email asking a question saying, I've tried, I've looked for this everywhere. Uh, when you send me that, if I see immediately that it's in Scott, I'll just write back and say, go look at Scott again. I won't give you the answer if I know you have the material in your hand. Uh, if, if it's in Bratzman, if it's in Scott, I'll just tell you, go back and look again. You'll find it there. And uh, maybe if you need someone to help you, have someone help you find it. But if it's there, I'll tell you. If it's not there or if I can see that it is indeed an issue, a problem. Because there are some of the Masora Parva and some of the textual critical apparatus items that will create confusion, will be a problem, and that you will not find an answer for anywhere else. And on those, I will help you. And those, I will send back a comment about it. And as we go through some of the issues here, I will try to help you uh, see what some of those might be. Uh, for example, as we look at uh, Joshua chapter 21 and we look at the textual critical apparatus, uh, you see Greek here. When you have Greek, do not translate it, just copy it. All right? When there's Greek, you translate it, don't copy it. Uh, when you have... Uh, See, I thought I saw another one here. When you have uh, items like this in Hebrew that are indicating things like uh, suffixes, copy it. You might not be able to explain what it's about, but just copy it. And so it'll be part of what you just put in to that column of notes and into the interpretive or, or uh, the meaning column. Uh, if you have new Hebrew words, if you want to attempt to translate them using the lexicon, you may do so. You're not required to do that. All right? Uh, if you have Latin, such as here, this Latin 
has to do with the textual critical apparatus and it tells us something and your Latin key in the front and the preface of your Hebrew Bibles or in the third edition of Scott have all the Latin you need to understand all of these things. But occasionally you'll have Latin that is from the Latin Vulgate. Don't attempt to translate it, just copy it. Just say the Vulgate has and then put the Latin. Sometimes you'll see some very strange words in italics that look like transliteration of Hebrew but it doesn't look like any Hebrew transliteration you've ever seen before. That is usually Syriac. Don't attempt to translate it, just copy it. The Syriac Peshitta has or the Syriac Peshitta says and then just copy it. Don't attempt to translate it. So don't make the task any more difficult than what is intended to be. Questions about that? Did you say uh, <coughs> just copy the Greek? Just copy. Put it in, but don't translate. If you want to translate it, I mean, have at it. If you have that much time and, and energy and uh, desire to know what it says, go right ahead. But you're not required to. And you will not have any points deducted if you don't translate it. And you don't gain any points if you do translate it. The other side of the point. All right? So trying to help you just do what's required. Okay, going back to this, when we go down to uh, the next textual uh, apparatus note, which is the uh, B, and that B is attached up here, superscript B, this is the verse we're working on, and we come down and we find that that B is right here, and that's the Syriac Peshitta symbol, it's the Gothic S, and Ut is Latin meaning as, so uh, the Syriac Peshitta reads as or reads like 1 Chronicles 6, chapter 6, verse 56, and this is what it reads, Ashtoret. And notice here, all I put in here was the Hebrew. I did not translate it, just supplied it. It tells you what the reading is. Okay? All right, let's move beyond this. When we look at the Masora Parva, we looked a little bit at the Masora Parva. Uh, we found it in the column. We uh, experienced some of the uh, challenges of looking at it, trying to figure out the abbreviations, looking them up in Scott. There are also other Masora. We looked at the Masora Magna, which you do nothing with for your assignment, just the Masora Parva. The Masora Magna are these down at the bottom of the text, above the text critical apparatus. You'll do nothing with regard to them. Then we have at the end of every one of the books of the Hebrew Bible what is called the Masora Finalis, the final Masora. And this is a fascinating thing. Uh, when we were doing Bible translation work in Bangladesh, I would use this to help me know how many verses we need to get done over how many days in order to complete a certain book in a certain period of time. Because what we have here is Sekum Hapesukim Shel Sefer. Uh, the, the total of the verses belonging to the book. And here it's the book of Joshua. Sheish meot wechemeshim weshisha. 656. 656 verses in the book of Joshua in the Hebrew text. Wechetzal, and the middle of it is umecheshbon. That is the middle word of the entire book. And that was something that one individual, was, uh, one scribe was assigned to count the words from the beginning of the book and from the end of the book to see what was the middle of the book. If the wrong word showed up in the middle, then they knew there was a mistake somewhere in the book and that disqualified the book from being used in the synagogue. It was an inaccurate copy. It was another way to just make certain that they had an exact copy of the text and it, so it's just another checkpoint. And you can go back and you can check that out and see it there. And then uh, with Sedarim is 15. Why do you think the 15 here is written as 5 and 10 instead of 10 and 5? So it doesn't look like Yahweh. So it doesn't look like a divine name. Yah, Yahweh. And in fact, in most Hebrew places, it is written instead with nine plus six, a nine and a six, a teth and a wow 
instead of using a he and a yod. And the seders are the individual weekly readings of the text. And there are 15 parts. So the total verse of the book, 656. And its middle is uh, Ume Cheshbon. And that's in chapter 13, verse 26. And there are 15 sedarim or lessons within the book. This is the Masora Finalis found at the end of every one of the books of the Hebrew Bible. Let's talk about some of the significant medieval Hebrew manuscripts. Remember what we said about MSS when it is on the line, not the superscript that comes after the symbol for Septuagint or Syriac or Vulgate, but that symbol, that, that abbreviation that's on the line, the main part of the reading, capital MSS or capital MS. MS means one manuscript. MSS means manuscripts plural, means more than one. Sometimes we're not told exactly how many there are. And those are medieval Hebrew manuscripts. And in your transcription of that, your translation of the textual critical apparatus, you must identify those as medieval Hebrew manuscripts or you lose a point on the meaning immediately. You must identify them as medieval Hebrew manuscripts. What are those medieval Hebrew manuscripts? So one of them is a British Library Codex, Orientalis 4445. That was the British Library's library accession number and identification for it. It's a manuscript of the Hebrew Bible that dates somewhere between 820 and 950 AD. It is one of the oldest complete manuscripts of the Hebrew Bible in existence. We have very few that are complete everything from Genesis through Second Chronicles. The Aleppo Codex is one of the most famous of all the codexes. In 1948, in Arab uprisings in Aleppo, Syria, they burned down the Aleppo synagogue. Inside the synagogue was one of the oldest Hebrew manuscripts in the world. It was partially damaged in the fire. Almost all of the Pentateuch was lost. All of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and a good portion of Deuteronomy was burned up in the fire. The interesting thing, as early as the late 1800s and on into the 1940s, scholars would go to Aleppo and request permission from the rabbis to photograph the Aleppo Codex to help preserve it for posterity. And in their religious uh, extremes, they forbade it. They said, no, you cannot. We will not allow it. It's a holy book. We will not allow you to photo photograph it. After the fire, the rabbi sought out the photographers and said, please, come photograph the remainder. They made a huge mistake because that was a very important, significant manuscript, and now we don't have anything of it left. Uh, it is the foundation of the Hebrew University Bible Project in which they are attempting to do a complete uh, uh, critical text of the Hebrew Bible based upon the Aleppo Codex. And you say, well, what are they going to do for the Pentateuch? Well, they've begun a process of, of search that includes looking at all of the rabbinical writings of all the rabbis that ever used the Aleppo Codex. And they are taking all of those writings and they are cataloging and collating all the readings that they drew from the Aleppo Codex in an attempt to reconstruct what the text was for that which no longer exists. And it will take them a long, long time. And there still may be some gaps, but they're going to do their best. And that's their goal to try to get that accomplished. They've already published the book of Isaiah, the book of Jeremiah in the Aleppo Codex. It's a fantastic set of volumes, uh, beautifully done. Uh, the uh, textual critical apparatus is written in English, so you can read it and understand it if you only read English. And it has uh, levels of apparatus that are far beyond any other edition that is available or perhaps ever will be available. It is one of the chief uh, projects of the Hebrew Bible. Codex Leningrad Densis B19A dates to approximately AD 1008. That is the text that is the foundation for Biblia Hebraica Stuttgartensia. The text you are working with 
when you do things with your Hebrew Bible is Codex Leningradensis B19A. It is the foundation of it. Uh, as I mentioned before, the policy in Hebrew Bible studies is that you take the best of the manuscripts and you copy it and you work with it. And if you do not accept its reading, you put your reasons for that and an alternative reading in the textual critical apparatus, but you don't mess with the text. And so this is one manuscript's testimony that you're looking at in the body of the text. And then the men who have done the editing of that manuscript, book by book, have then added the text critical apparatus in the, in the front of your Hebrew Bibles. On the back of the title page, you're told exactly who those men are. For Genesis, it's Otto Eisfeld, and he edited Genesis in 1969. Georg Kale in 1973 for Exodus and Leviticus. Numbers by Wilhelm Rudolph in 1972. Deuteronomy by Johann Hempel in 1972. Rudolf Meyer for Joshua and Judges in 1972. Uh, Peter A. H. De Boer. The Books of Samuel in 1976, The Books of Kings by uh, Jepson in 1974, and Isaiah by David Winton Thomas in 1968, Jeremiah by Wilhelm Rudolph in 1970, etc. You can go down through and see who did this, and you can see the dates for them. And if you go through and you look at these men, you find out that most of these men are pretty much uh, liberal scholars, those who believed in uh, the documentary hypothesis, those who denied the uh, inspiration and inerrancy of scripture. And you have to take that into account as you look at their notes. You have to realize from what their background, their theological perceptions, what their approach to text was in how they offered and why they offered certain readings. And you'll find some of the readings they offer changes in the text with absolutely no evidence at all to support them. And those are ones you want to be very careful of. Yes, sir? What little crosses mean next to their names? That means they're deceased. Okay. Okay, so the, these are three of the major codexes. And uh, we have now become very familiar with the scrolls from the Dead Sea. And if you ever visit Israel, you need to go to the Museum of the Book. And you need to walk through the main gallery where they have a photographed copy of one of the Isaiah scrolls that's behind plexiglass that spread around the interior circle. And it is just amazing to walk down that and see it. And what you see, for example, is what you've got right here in front of you. Uh, this is from, uh, when we look at the identification for the Qumran scrolls, the number at the beginning stands for the number of the cave. The letter stands for the location. Then the name of the book and then the order in which that book was found. So this is the first book of Isaiah located at Qumran in cave one. So it's Qumran cave one Isaiah, the first copy of Isaiah found in cave one. If you have that superscript A, that tells you there's more than one copy of Isaiah were found in that cave. And this is the first one found. And this text is Isaiah 40, verses 6 through 20. And as you look at this, what strikes you about it? What do you see? What do you observe in this copy of the book of Isaiah? There's no accents. Okay, no accents, no vowel pointings. What else do you notice? There's spaces. There's what? For lack of a better term, those big squiggles above a lot of the lines. That's actually more Hebrew. Like up there, you have Hebrew. And it's inserted. Here you have Hebrew, inserted. And down the, col down the side, sideways, you have Hebrew. Over here you have it on the text on the next leaf over where you have it. What do you think that is? What's, that, what's the reason for that? I'll tell you, it's not Masora Parva. Creighton? Is it the value of something to write on? <laughs> no. When you look up here, see the dots underneath those letters right there? That's Udavar and the word. There's dots under it. That is the scribal indication that after that there has been an omission. The scribe made a huge mistake. What he left out 
is then added above. And it runs over here, down here, and all the way down here. It was a very big omission. All right. Notice something else. Do you see four dots up there? Those four dots represent the tetragrammaton. The four letters of Yahweh. Because the scribe who inserted the correction is not considered sanctified enough to write the name Yahweh. And so if the name Yahweh is to be inserted, his job was just to put four dots. And the next scribe who was sanctified, who went through special washing and cleansing, would write in with a different pen and different ink. Special sanctified pen, special sanctified ink, would write in the name Yahweh. Now, what does it tell you? that those four dots are still in the text. Never got around to it. It's not finished. It's, it's unfinished. Why is it unfinished? Because you hide it. Because you know the because Andrew? There, because there's no access to the temple to get sanctified. No. Why wouldn't it be finished, anyone? Because it's not worthy of completion. It's too flawed. It's never going to be used in any synagogue, anywhere, at any time. Why finish a flawed scroll? And you say, but this scroll is huge. It's long. Why would they waste it that way? Because of the preservation and respect of the text. So what did they do with it? They gave it an honorable burial. Do you know why it's found? These are scrolls are found in the clay jars with, with lids on them that are sealed with asphalt and tar. It's to give it a burial. These scrolls were not put in the jars to preserve them for eternity because they are good scrolls that are used. These are the discarded scrolls. They're given an honorable burial. Uh, when I worked for Eisenbrands and I was working on an article uh, by Emmanuel Tove on the Aleppo Codex and was typesetting it, he sent a very explicit instruction. He said, as you work on this text, the photographs of the text that I supply to you are to be treated with respect. When you are finished with them, return them to me or put them in files, but do not destroy them because they represent the sacred text of the Hebrew Bible. He said, when you work on this and you produce uh, copies for uh, making the plates from, and you have this photosensitive paper that you put through the immersion to cause it to come out, when you photograph it, when you make the plates for printing, do not burn or discard the paper that has the text on it. That was the instruction. We were not to destroy it and uh, do anything with it that would be considered disrespectful. That's the regard they have for the text. That's the man who wrote this textual criticism of the Hebrew Bible that is considered worldwide to be the textbook on textual criticism of the Old Testament. It is used in almost every country of the world where Old Testament textual criticism is taught. His Hebrew edition is used in Israel. The English edition is used elsewhere. And it's just, uh, that is the respect they have for it. So gentlemen, what does that mean to textual criticism in our use of the Dead Sea Scrolls? What are the implications of that little bit of fact for you? That these are discarded scrolls because they were too flawed to be used in the synagogue. Then why in the world are we using them in textual criticism then. If they were so flawed that they could not be utilized, had to be given an, uh, an honorable burial, then why are we attempting to question the existing text of the Masoretic text on the basis of these scrolls and try to get a new reading from these scrolls that have been rejected in the past because of their inaccuracies? You see, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Yes, they ought to be looked at. 
they ought to be considered. But we have to constantly be aware of the fact that these are flawed scrolls and therefore ought to be very cautious and ought to have plenty of additional evidence to support any time that we side with a Dead Sea scroll against the Masoretic text. And it all comes out of having properly understood what these scrolls are really about and what's involved with them. As you look at this text, uh, the problem here is that uh, as the uh, reader was coming down through the text, he had here that uh, you have the, the grass is dry and the flower withers because the spirit of Yahweh is breathed on it. Therefore, the people are grass. The grass dries, the flower withers. Notice it's the same phrase. The eye of the scribe skipped from here to here and went past this because it's repeated. So he had this. So what does he do? He jumps all the way down to Udavar, Elohenu. So everything between Ki and Udavar has been omitted because of that looking aside, looking back to the text, going to the wrong point in the text where you have a similar ending and starting at the wrong ending. And that's one of the problems that happens with scribes. Uh, you get tired, you get sleepy, you get to a point to where you've been doing this all day long and it's dull and boring and you look away for a minute and you look back and your eye goes to the wrong place on the page and you just continue to write. And as a result, this scroll, this large, beautiful scroll, is discarded, given an honorable burial, because it's unfit. And the problem is, it's not just here that this happened. It happens, you can see another one over here, that's written in here, that's an insertion that was omitted. And you walk down the length of the scroll, you find many such in the scroll. It was not well copied. Eric? Okay. Good. What do we do with the Qumran texts and the uh, uh, various texts that are found at Nachal Hever, Muraba, Wadi Murabaat, and many other places? There are a number of locations where there are scrolls that were found around the region of the Dead Sea, not just at Qumran. And there are over 200 biblical scrolls. There are over a thousand total scrolls, but not all of them are biblical books. They're only to date identified 214 biblical books. 214, not shouldn't say biblical books, biblical scrolls representing biblical books. Andrew? Why would they bury non-biblical books? Why would they what? Bury uh, non-biblical books. Why would they bury non-biblical books? Because the books that th were there otherwise had a lot of citations and quotes of the Bible. And some of the books that were found that way were not really buried. Some of those were in a library in uh, especially Cave 4 that appeared to be a double room and appeared to be a regular library. And then there's another cave where there were mainly Greek manuscripts that were kept that appears to have been a library. And so there were library sections and then there were burial sections for discarded scrolls. So there are different kinds of caves, different kinds of preservation. Now when we look at all of these, and we try to figure out what's going on with them. We say, okay, how many of the biblical scrolls from the Dead Sea represent or seem to be identical to our Masoretic text? 35%. Now, let's go further though, because that's not the whole picture. There's what we call the Qumran practice texts. The Qumran practice texts do not exactly follow the Masoretic text because they do things like, for example, inserting vowel letters to demonstrate what a word should be. Let me give an example. If I take the uh, Hebrew word for you, uh, lamed and a kaf sofit, we're used to seeing that as laka, right? Now, if you don't have any vowels, how do you write that? In the Qumran practice, a hey replaced the comments. So we know that when we see this, we're looking at a second masculine singular pronominal suffix, not a second feminine singular pronominal suffix. So it agrees with the Masoretic text, but it's written in the tradition of 
Qumran, which means the letters themselves will be different. And the vast majority of the Qumran practice texts are identical to the Masoretic text with that very small adjustment. Then we have what are called non-aligned texts. The non-aligned texts include texts that can go either way. We don't know if they support the Masoretic text or if they support the Septuagint or if they support the Samaritan Pentateuch. It's hard to identify. Why? Because there's not enough of the manuscript to make a judgment. And what it does have can go with any of the groupings. So there's just not enough. In that, Dr. Tove identified a percentage that he felt would prove eventually, if they found enough little fragments to piece it together, uh, would be to support the Masoretic text. How many of the texts supported the Samaritan text? The Samaritan text is supported by less than 5% of all of the texts found at Qumran. And then we have the Septuagint. When I was in seminary, uh, it was just within, what, uh, it was less than 20 years since the finding of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And there was a lot of uh, fervor about their find and about what an exciting thing this was to have all these very old Hebrew texts from around the Dead Sea. And it seemed like every year new ones were found, new caves were discovered. And uh, as that began to go on, we had tons of books written. And those books, and I was taught in seminary, that the Dead Sea Scrolls predominantly supported the Septuagint text, not the Masoretic text. And if you go back and you read some of the books written in the 1950s, 60s, and even in the 70s, you will find that that theory was what was out there. You will find that uh, the writers were saying that the Masoretic text is not supported by the, the Dead Sea Scrolls. Instead, the Septuagint text, or the Hebrew base, or forlaga, for the Septuagint is supported by Qumran. Now... Years and years later, with lots of research done and almost all of the main biblical texts published and examined by scholars around the world, only 5% of the Dead Sea Scrolls outright support the Septuagint. If there are any others to support the Septuagint, they would have to be located in these non-aligned texts. And most of the scholars today, I'd say 75% of the scholars, Old Testament critics today, uh, do not believe that they'll find many more in that grouping, even if they recover enough fragments to then say, okay, we've got enough to identify this scroll. Most of them are pretty much of the opinion that the vast majority of these, these two colors will actually be reversed. And uh, this is put this way just out of caution and not to overstate the case. But look at the bright yellow, which is the support for the Masoretic text as opposed to support for the Septuagint as opposed to support for the Samaritan, as, a suppo as opposed to support for any other textual uh, matter. Uh, there have been a number of writers, Al Walters, in face of Old Testament studies, uh, stated outright that the support from the Qumran scrolls is invariably for and overwhelmingly for and in support of the integrity and accuracy of the Masoretic text. Emmanuel Tove says the same thing in each of the editions. And in fact, in this third edition, he's even stronger about it than he was in the second edition. In the first edition, he was so strong, he made a direct statement and said over 60% of all the biblical manuscripts at Qumran were on the side of or in the camp of demonstrating the validity and integrity and accuracy of the Masoretic text. He backed off of that in the second edition to say 35% because he had not adequately accounted for the non-aligned text and he was asked to back off and be uh, less uh, emphatic in that angle. And so he did. But in the third edition, he's begun again to move back that direction because the more study that is done, the more it is shown that the Qumran scrolls do not support the Septuagint text the way I was taught in seminary. They support the Masoretic text. Yes, sir. Um, how would they, how, I'm not sure what it means, but they support the Septuagint reading. Like, you're talking about the Hebrew manuscript, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, In other words, that they would have a Hebrew reading 
that would be found only in the Greek and not in any Hebrew manuscript. Like in terms of words? You uh, right. Uh, let me give you an example. All right. Uh, if, if you look at uh, Genesis chapter 4 in your Bibles and you see there the story of Cain and Abel. And we're told in that uh, part there that uh, uh, Cain and Abel went into the field. And we're told that uh, uh, Cain spoke with his brother. And when you look at that, it, it, it looks as though there might be something missing. That, uh, and let me get the right place here. Uh, it's in verse 8. Wayomer Cain el Hevel Achau. Uh, so Cain spoke to Abel, his brother. Now there are those who insist that this should be translated, so Cain said to Abel, his brother, and they're saying what he said is missing from the text. The Septuagint provides us with a very brief statement there to fill that in. It is not found in any Hebrew manuscript. So if that is found in a Qumran manuscript, then that manuscript would be taken as being in support of the Septuagint. Does that help to understand better? So that's what is meant by that. Is that uh, there are things in the Septuagint, there are translations in the Septuagint in Greek, that are not represented by anything in the Hebrew text as we know it, the Masoretic text. And so if they find a Hebrew text in the Dead Sea Scrolls that appears to be the base, the Hebrew base for that Greek, then they consider that to be supporting the Septuagint. Yes? So, so are you saying then we shouldn't really give too much thought to the Septuagint? Or is like the case like that where there's something there that's not in the Hebrew right. I didn't say anything about what to do with it. <laughs> we'll get to that later. Right, so don't jump to a conclusion here yet, because I haven't given you my conclusion on the Septuagint. We're just right now talking about Qumran. And I have one more question about, yes. when, you, when you were back on the slide about the, um, when you showed the manuscript and you were talking about how it was buried, well like those scrolls. Not buried, not buried like underground, right, it was right. put in jars, right. that was considered the burial. And uh, like these scribes that made these mistakes, were they then, were they then like, punished or disqualified from being a scribe? What they do? What they do with those guys? Well, sometimes they were punished. Sometimes they lost a uh, ration for food, or they lost certain privileges. Uh, they were disciplined. Uh, they weren't taken out in stone, though. All right. Yes, Josh. Um, just to help for understanding with these percentages, when you're saying they're in support, is that primarily? Because obviously, I'm sure there's some overlapping. So is that referring to the... The overlapping is right here. Okay, so that's the overlapping. So those in support, those are referring specifically to passages where there's contradictions. Where there's, where there's outright support, where there's a clear difference between Septuagint, Samaritan, and Masoretic text. So here, this is where there's clear evidence that it's supporting Masoretic text rather than any other. The same here, the same here. And here where there's clear evidence that the Hebrew text in those scrolls, the 5% of the scrolls, is clearly the same text as the Septuagint and not overlapping with anything in the Masoretic text, just like I gave you in Genesis 4.8. Okay? All right? So I just want to point that out for two reasons. Number one, remember that when fines are made, the initial response to fines and initial assessment is often very inaccurate. And yet some people become very dogmatic about it immediately. The scholars became very dogmatic in the 1950s and 1960s especially that the Dead Sea Scrolls unequivocally supported the Septuagint text contrary to the Masoretic text. And they began immediately to change Bible translations accordingly starting with the Revised Standard Version of 1956, which is the first English translation, major English translation, to take into account the findings of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And that would continue for a number of decades until finally, the, with the NIV, the NIV is the last major English translation to demonstrate an over-dependence upon the Septuagint in its Old Testament translation. 
and it's one of the faults of the NIV, and I'll get to that more later. The question was about the Septuagint, and I'll come back to that. But uh, we're talking about the Qumran text right now. And that lasted, the uh, NIV translation is, starts in the 1970s. And by then it was beginning to fade out and we're beginning to get enough knowledge of what's going on. But by the 1990s especially, it became inexcusable to claim that the Dead Sea Scrolls supported the Septuagint rather than the Masoretic text. In the end, everyone now is admitting that the Dead Sea Scrolls are overwhelmingly documentation for the accuracy and integrity of the Masoretic text. All right. Ernst Wirtwein, in his book on Old Testament textual criticism called The Text of the Old Testament, talks about the symbols in the Hexapla. The Hexapla was written by uh, Origen, about 230 AD. You see, the Dead Sea Scrolls are those scrolls written from about 200, 250 BC to almost uh, 70 AD. There are some late scrolls, there are copies that would come right up to about 70 AD. There's also, I must tell you, some scrolls that were found at uh, Masada that are included among the Dead Sea Scrolls. The scrolls at Masada were obviously very, very, very different from any scrolls found anywhere else in any cave or any location throughout the Dead Sea region. First of all, they were not given an honorable burial or discarded because they were not used in the synagogue. Second of all, they were located in the synagogue. Thirdly, they were, on, they were beautiful scrolls. You could tell that the, uh, the script on them is just very beautifully arranged. It probably is due to the royal support for the production of those scrolls to be used in the palace of Herod up there at the synagogue on Masada. So it had the royal support and uh, uh, payment for making certain that these were the best scrolls that were available. They were probably done by priests in Jerusalem. They were not done at Qumran, at the scriptorium there. They were brought there from the temple probably in Jerusalem by priests. And those particular scrolls there are fascinating because we do know those were utilized. Those were not flawed. And those are letter for letter exactly what we have in the Masoretic text. It is amazing how exact it is. So some would even point out that the very best of the Dead Sea Scrolls, specifically those that probably came from Jerusalem and not written at all at Qumran in the scriptorium, are very much exactly what you would expect if the Masoretic text is the correct text. Uh, they support it fully. Now it's a handful of texts to be sure, but it's still an interesting find. Uh, but we jump from there and we can look at other things. We'll look at different things, but let's jump up to 230 AD. Because in 230 AD, Origen was very concerned about what was happening in the church. The church had begun to use the Septuagint as its Bible. Uh, they put the Greek Old Testament together with the Greek New Testament, and that's what they cited. And notice the New Testament authors, 75% of the quotes of the Old Testament in the New Testament are from the Septuagint. And part of the reason for that is because that's the copy of Scripture the people had if they were going to use it. If, they, if you go to a church, for example, and you find out that no one in the church you're going to has anything except a King James Bible, you would be a fool not to be quoting the King James Bible in your sermons or to use it at least until you were able to convince them to change to a different version. Because the text they have in their laps is that text. And so if you want to teach people, you begin with what they have, you begin with what they are familiar with, and you work from there. And that's what the New Testament writers did. They used the Bible that was available that the people knew. They even quoted sections of the Septuagint which were obviously wrong translations. Acts chapter 8, you have the Ethiopian eunuch and he's reading from the book of Isaiah and he's reading from Isaiah chapter 53. And what is he reading? Luke records exactly the text he's reading and it's obvious he's reading from the Greek Septuagint. And from the exact passage that almost everyone liberal scholar and evangelical scholar alike agree is one of the most flawed, inaccurate, 
awkward translations anywhere in the Greek Septuagint. And it's right there. We're told exactly what he was reading. Or the writer of the Hebrews in chapter 1 is defending the superiority of Christ. And because he knows that the people have the Septuagint, he quotes from Deuteronomy chapter 32 verse 43 a text that is not found in any Hebrew manuscript except maybe one in the Dead Sea Scrolls that very well may have been prepared as a back translation from the Greek. Why did the writers do that? Well, the same as they used, uh, as Jude used Enoch, a non-biblical book, and cited and quoted it in Jude. The same as Paul quoted pagan poets. If they had the literature and the people were familiar with it, if it advanced their argument and their point, they would use it. They would use it because that's what the people had. Now, if he had used only Deuteronomy 32.43 to support the superiority of Christ, we'd have an issue. We'd have a problem. But it's one of only about seven different texts that he utilizes to support the superiority of Christ. And it's basically he says, and by the way, you also have this flawed translation you know, that you're using all the time. And you're convinced pretty much that that's your Bible. And it even supports the superiority of Christ over angels. You see? It's as, so, as though you would use 1 John chapter 5, what is it, verse 7, out of the King James to tell people, look, you, you believe in the Trinity. You, the Bible you use all the time has the Trinity in 1 John 5, 7. You don't stop to tell them, oh, but by the way, there's only five Greek manuscripts to support that, and four of them were probably uh, uh, produced as the result of Erasmus saying, I'll only include this text in my Greek New Testament in the next edition if I find a manuscript in Greek that has it. And so four of them obviously seem to have come and been written after Erasmus made that statement. And so there's very little, if, if any, support at all for the text. But if you're talking to people that are King James only and they're arguing with you about the Trinity, you're going to use that text and say, hey, you believe your Bible, don't you? And that's what it says, so don't you believe in the Trinity or are you denying the Trinity? And so you might even use that. But hopefully that's not the only argument you have. Hopefully you have about 20 good sound biblical arguments elsewhere and that you use that only as a parting shot to say, you know, I, I, I don't understand why you reject this when you hold this Bible so highly and think it's the word of God incarnate and that it is, is, is uh, inspired in its translation and is even used, supposed to be used to correct the Greek manuscripts. Then why can't you accept the Trinity when a verse like that speaks to it? You see? That's why Paul would quote a Cretan poet, a pagan poet, a Greek poet. Why Jude would quote Enoch is because at times they used what the people were familiar with and used the argumentation the people used to support things and went and used that. And that's why Deuteronomy 32, 43 is probably used in Hebrews chapter 1. So the reason that the Septuagint is used so often in the New Testament is not because it's a better text it's used because that's the only text the people have. They could not afford a Hebrew manuscript. It took a king's ransom to buy one. And then you'd only have one book. You'd have to buy each scroll separately. Yes, sir? Um, I'm wondering if Paul quotes Acts, or quotes the pagan poets in Acts, it says, your poets say, I'm wondering if in Hebrews 1, verse 6, when it, when it quotes Deuteronomy 32, when he says, God says, he's the only saying God says it. I'm wondering. Well, Deuteronomy 32 is the entirety is spoken by God. So I think he's just using that in the general context. I don't think he's being specific about that particular phrase or that particular part of the verse. And there's very little support for retaining that verse, by the way, in Deuteronomy. Very little support. All right. Now, the reason I jumped to, to origin is because of that issue over the Septuagint. It became well known in the church by 230 AD that the church was becoming over dependent upon the Septuagint and had divorced itself from the original Hebrew of the Hebrew Bible of the Old Testament. And they had begun to produce a variety of translations in Greek. Symmachus, you have Aquila, you have Theodotion, and you have a number of other daughter editions and versions of the Greek Bible that the early church is utilizing. 
And so Origen says, we've got to get this thing focused back on the Hebrew text. What does the Hebrew say? He prepared the hexapla, six columns, in order to demonstrate and parallel the various editions and translations with the Hebrew text and show us what it says. We can take his Hebrew text and we can compare it from 230 AD. We can compare it to the Masoretic text that we have that dates from about 700 AD, 500 years later, and we find them identical. All right? As you're going through, he even mark, he made these markings, and these are in word fine. The asterisk or asterixis, an X with four dots around it. That was used to indicate words in the original text which are lacking in the Septuagint. Were borrowed from another version inserted in the Septuagint column marked that way. In other words, there were places when the Septuagint did not represent the Hebrew text. And so he would have a back translation to Greek of that and put it into the Septuagint column. But he'd clearly mark it to say this text is what's missing in our Greek translations, but it is in the Hebrew. And in those cases we find that the same Hebrew he had is the same Hebrew we have. So even at 230 AD we find the Masoretic text has dominant support in the first textual critic in the history of the church, Origen. A massive work. A massive examination to try to demonstrate the inaccuracies of the Greek translations of his day. As we look at this evidence, we could say, and when I say here Masoretic text up here, uh, we could put quotes around that. We could call it pre-Masoretic. We could call it proto-Masoretic. I call it Masoretic text because essentially it is no different than what we know as the Masoretic text. And so then you come down, the first one that we have as a testimony is Samaritan Pentateuch in 400 to 100 AD. And the Samaritan Pentateuch supports the Masoretic text, except in those areas where the Samaritans, for religious reasons and for their theological differences with the Jewish community, changed the text. And those are very obvious when they do that when they change the location of the temple and the place of sacrifice to Mount Gerizim as opposed to Jerusalem. It's very clear what they're doing. The Septuagint in its translation 250 to 150 BC, as much as we talk about the differences between the Septuagint and the Masoretic text, the vast majority of the Septuagint text supports the Masoretic text. The number of differences between the Septuagint and the Masoretic text are not nearly as large as some would like to make it. And it depends on what book you're in too. If you're in the book of Job, you have far more differences between the Septuagint and uh, the uh, Masoretic text than perhaps anywhere else. The book of Jeremiah is just reordered. There's a lot of differences there, but much the same text. Yes, sir? Yeah, I thought the Samaritan Pentateuch has, it's only the first five books. That's why we call it the Pentateuch. And so, but I thought the place to worship wasn't established until the, the, the latter, the former prophets? You mean the uh, place at Jerusalem? Yeah. It was established at the time of David when he brought the ark to so Jerusalem. So wow. that's, that's 900 uh, or uh, close to 1000 BC. So why, why, what, what would the Samaritans do with their penalty with regard to the, the place of worship? Like, um, they would change it to where it read that it was Gerizim, Mount Gerizim. Even though like the penalty doesn't really address that? Um, Correct. Oh. Right. They would reinterpret it. That's why it's so obvious the changes they make. It's so obvious difference from the reading that's there. Uh, Qumran text, 300 B.C. to A.D. 50, some say A.D. 70. Syriac Peshitta, A.D. 125 to 400. Hexapla, A.D. 230. Latin Vulgate, Jerome, 390. Uh, he petitions Pope Damascus to help him do a brand new translation to finance his brand new translation from the Hebrew. Why? Because like Origen before him, who was concerned about Greek translations, Jerome became concerned about the old Latin translations having departed from the Hebrew text. So he petitioned to have a brand new translation project based upon the Hebrew text alone. He didn't know Hebrew when he made the petition. So he hired a rabbi in Bethlehem to teach him Hebrew and to be his mentor and to be his informant as he did that translation. He learned Hebrew and he began to translate from the Hebrew. And when you look at Jerome's Vulgate, not the Vulgate of Pope Sixtus, in the counter-reformation period but the Vulgate of Jerome you find that that Vulgate supports the Masoretic text almost entirely. 
So there's the, there's the trail of support for the Masoretic text. All of these, as you move forward, you don't have to wait to 700 AD because we have enough parallel texts, we have enough copies of Hebrew, we have enough transliterations of Hebrew, we have enough translations of the Hebrew to know what the Hebrew text was from about 300 BC all the way down to 700 AD. And gentlemen, it does not differ markedly from that which we have right now in Lengradensis B19A. All right? Yes? Clarification. When you say it supports the Masoretic text, yes. is that just the actual consonants that were written, or it's also the tradition of reading? Actually, the tradition of reading, because as we saw on the Dead Sea Scrolls, number one, they could do things like this. Where a vowel would make a difference, the Dead Sea Scrolls use letters to show that distinction, and they match the Masoretic text distinction. The word divisions are the same. The paragraph divisions, the large spaces, where the, now the masteries put the psalmics and the pays, are virtually the same. Dr. Tom Finley at Talbot did an extensive study of the Isaiah scrolls from Qumran, comparing the breaks in the text with the Masoretic text, and his conclusion was they overwhelmingly support what we see in the Masoretic text. So it demonstrates conclusively that the Masoretes were faithful in their preservation of a text that was much older than they. Let me go over this table one more time just to explain what this is all about because I think that uh, sometimes we uh, forget how much support our text has uh, the, in talking about the Hebrew text of the Masoretic text. We often think, we just look at the idea of AD 700 and we say AD 700 is the beginning of the Masoretic text. We say that's when the accents go in, that's when the vowel points go in. And so we automatically assume that it is so long after the writing of the text. I mean, after all, Ezra is 1,100 years prior, right? So at least a millennium prior. If we're going to go back to Moses, we're going to go back then and be 2,100 years, two millennia prior. And so we look at that and we think, well, there's no way the Masoretes would be able to convey us the text exactly as had been given as, as Moses wrote it, for example, or even Ezra. Too much time has passed. Now, granted, we have very little evidence prior to about 300 BC physically, as far as archaeology is concerned. But what we do have, as we go backwards, we find out if we go back to the 5th century AD at 400 AD, and we go back to the 3rd century AD with Origen, and we go back to the 2nd century AD with the Peshitta, and back to even the 3rd century BC with the Qumran text, with the Septuagint, and the, and the Samaritan Pentateuch to the 4th century BC, we do have a lot of evidence prior. We have a millennia worth of evidence prior to the Masoretes that we can compare their work with and analyze it. And I think sometimes we also forget how careful all the Hebrew scribes have been and what they practice all the way along. I mean, even the fact that we see flawed manuscripts at Qumran and we recognize there the difficulty that human beings have, fallen human beings have, in being accurate in producing something, notice the care they took to make certain that that type of manuscript did not get used. That ought to tell us something. That it has been a pattern in the Hebrew community to care for their text in this fashion. And there's no reason for us to believe that it just suddenly started in AD 700. Or it suddenly started at Qumran in 300 BC. Because they're merely carrying on a tradition that has been passed down to them from the time of Moses. Read the Old Testament. Read what is said about accurate copying. Read what is said about write down my words. Read what it says over and over again. Don't subtract. Don't add. That's repeated in all three major sections of the Old Testament. The Torah, the writings, and the prophets. It's repeated at the end of the book of Revelation. It is the attitude that God's people had to his word evidently by the leading of the Spirit of God. 
And we see that depicted in the word. Uh, I, we'll be talking about a few other things here. And I'll take you back to Jeremiah chapter 36. We'll talk about it. We'll go back to 1 Samuel chapter 13. We're going to talk about it. There are examples we can look at that will help us to better understand the preservation of the text. But we also see that they didn't need vowel pointings for many centuries because of the fact they memorized the text. They had a set reading of the text. They used vowel letters at Qumran where there would be confusion in the text due to differences in pronunciation. So that make it clear. We have all those things are taken care of. And it was well learned and passed on very accurately. Now let's, let's take an example just to... I know we're, we're going to come back and look at some other things. And uh, when we get into uh, Old Testament introduction, we're also going to talk about some more things in that course. But uh, let's take one example of a problem text in the Old Testament and see what we can do with the textual evidence. Let's take the problem that we find here in 1 Samuel chapter 6, verse 19. And it is the text about the Ark of the Covenant. And we're told that when it was at uh, Beit Shemesh, that uh, we're told that there was a smiting. It says that, the, that uh, Yahweh, he, he smote the men of Beth Shemesh because they looked into the ark of Yahweh. So he smote the people, 70 men, 50,000 men. So they, the people mourned because Yahweh had smitten the people with a great smiting. Now many people look at that and say, 50,070 men slain at Beit Shemesh? First of all, if you've ever been to Beit Shemesh, it's a small city. The archaeologists, the historians, those who study demographics, the uh, science of populations, will tell us that at no time in history, as far as we're aware of, were there more than 25,000 people total living at Beit Shemesh. So how could there be 50,070 men killed? You see the problem? That's the issue. That's the problem. And you look at the translations, you find out that different translators have tried to resolve this problem in different ways. Some have said it only involved 70 people being killed. Taking that first, Shiva'im Ish, and saying that the Hemeshim Elef Ish is a later addition. Instead of 50,070, just 70. How legitimate is that solution? How much support can we find? What does Old Testament textual criticism do with a problem of this nature? First of all, looking at it, 70 men, 50,000 men, note the repetition of men, ish, in both halves. Sheva'im ish, chemashim elef ish. Note the absence of a conjunction. There's no wow. All right? No wow on chemashim. There's no and. It's not 70 men and 50,000 men. It's 70 men, 50,000 men. So let's go with that in mind, understanding it. We look at the superscript D's that mark off 50,000 men. We go down to the textual critical apparatus and we find this symbol, which means it is omitted. It is omitted in PCMSS. Okay, what does PCMSS mean? Anyone? What kind of manuscripts, Eric? Medieval Hebrew, Medieval Hebrew manuscripts, right. What's PC mean? It doesn't mean personal computer, all right? What's PC mean? It's the Latin pauci. It's given for you both in the, uh, uh, tech, in the uh, notes that I gave you on uh, page 113 in the study notes. It's also in the front of your Hebrew Bibles. If you go to the list of all the symbols and abbreviations in this edition on the top of Roman numeral page 50, the capital L, you'll see it there in the front of your Hebrew Bible and it'll tell you. And what does it tell you about it? A few. 
What's a few mean? All right, a few means three to ten. But notice, except in the books of First and Second Samuel. What does it mean in First and Second Samuel? Three to six. Three to six. Now, just take a look at the rest of this. Go down to P-E-R-M-L-T, Permulti Manuscripts, on the bottom of page 113 in the study notes, or on page 50 in the preface of your Hebrew Bible. And notice there that only in First and Second Samuel is that Latin ascription utilized. It means more than 60, six zero manuscripts. What does that tell you? That tells you that there are more than 60 medieval Hebrew manuscripts of the books of Samuel. So if we have three to six that delete it, what percentage of the total manuscripts on Samuel omit these three words? At the most, 10%. Six out of 60 taking the lowest high figure and the highest low figure, we're being very gracious and very cautious. All right, we're not exaggerating that way. We're giving as much space as possible. 10% of the manuscripts omit. What does that mean? That means 90% of the manuscripts include 50,000. Now granted, the best way to find this out and settle it is to look at every single manuscript that omits and every single manuscript that includes. Identify the dates of those manuscripts. Identify the scribes of those manuscripts. If they belong to any families of manuscripts or what they were dependent upon, where they were produced, under what, what conditions they were produced, and what are the qualities of those individual manuscripts is the only way you can dogmatically settle that issue. That's what's involved in textual criticism, gentlemen. It's not just counting the number. We have to evaluate the manuscripts. We have to account for all of the evidence. Textual criticism is not where you just go read what's in the bottom of the textual critical, ap critical apparatus in your Hebrew Bible. That's not doing textual criticism. Textual criticism is checking every single piece of evidence, evaluating each piece of evidence, and reaching a viable conclusion. And with some of those issues, that takes almost a lifetime to do. And unfortunately, there are very few men willing to spend a lifetime working on these issues and getting to know all these manuscripts. Dan Wallace, in the New Testament side of things, has been traveling the world looking for more Greek manuscripts of the New Testament. He found some new ones in Albania that no one knew about. Very old manuscripts. And he's photographing these and, and making a digital library, trying to make certain that what happened at Aleppo with the Aleppo manuscript doesn't happen again with even Greek manuscripts. They're cataloging, they're digitizing, they're collecting, they're preparing to be able to study these things with great detail. If you're going to do this in Old Testament, you've got to be fluent in Latin, in Greek, in Syriac, in Samaritan, in Hebrew, in Aramaic. You've got to probably be able to work in German and French and Dutch. And you've got to have the ability to look at these things. You've got to have the ability to go to the libraries, look at the manuscripts, read different hands and different scripts to do the work. How many men are willing to prepare themselves to that extent? Very few. And we wonder why then the liberal theologians and scholars dominate the field of textual criticism. Because we don't have any evangelicals willing to step up to that bar and measure up to that demand. Now we have some good excuses, right? God called us to preach the gospel, not to become a scholar. But remember that by not having evangelical scholars to defend the integrity of God's word, we end up being marginalized in the conversations, the materials, 
Our books then are not published by the publishers. And many things happen if we lose that. And in the history of the church, at every period of the history of the church, there's always been those, we could call them scholar priests, who serve God, preach the gospel, serve the body of Christ fervently with compassion in ministering the needs of people, but also burned the literal midnight oil to learn, to excel, and to do that which is necessary to be certain that we have the materials to work with, that we have Bible translations, that we have uh, work done in Hebrew and Greek, that we have commentaries, that we have theologies written. Where would the church be today without many of the materials you and I have on our shelves and use every single day in preparing messages from the Word of God? Someone has to do it. And we vacated the field and allowed the liberals to handle it. And if we get out of it what they produce, then we get out of it what we've left to them to do. And it's really high time that we stepped up to the plate and said, we've got a responsibility. We're the ones who really love this word. We're the ones who believe in its inerrancy and its authenticity, its integrity, and its inspiration. So we ought to be the ones that ought to be defending it. We ought to be the ones who know it the best. Not the worst, the best. The best Hebrew scholars, the best Greek scholars ought to be evangelicals. Why? Because we love this word. It's God's word. And yet we have too few that have that fervency or will dedicate their lives to it. And if there's anyone here who would be willing to dedicate their lives to even a small part of that, I would encourage you greatly to do so. It is something that we need desperately. Right? We have the evidence then for that reading that only about 10%, speaking magnanimously, 10% of medieval Hebrew manuscripts actually omit 50,000. Let's look at another reading here. D is absent in a few three to six medieval Hebrew manuscripts. And then the E superscript. The E superscript is just on Hemeshim, 50. And it says N-O-N-N manuscripts and C-I-T-T have what? What does that mean? What does that tell you the reading is about? Notice up here in the text, no conjunction wow. What do we have down here? A wow conjunction added. How many medieval manuscripts add the wow to 50? Notice they don't change the 50. They just add a wow to it. And and. How many? From 7 to 15 medieval Hebrew manuscripts add the wow. Now that's, bu- that's among those that keep the 50,000 because they have to have the 50 there to put the wow on. All right? So they're not among these. They're different manuscripts. So we have 7 to 15 medieval Hebrew manuscripts. What's CITT stand for? Rabbinic citations. Medieval rabbinic citations. Uh, I gave that to you on page 113 in the study notes. You remember what we said about the rabbis quoting from the Aleppo Codex and how the Hebrew University Bible Project is trying to get the text from the rabbis? Well, that's what this is talking about. That also a large number of rabbinic citations of this verse demonstrate that the rabbis put a wow on it, either in their translation of it or they had that text in front of them that way. And then compare it with the Septuagint the Syriac, and the Vulgate. Now, when you see that, what does that mean? It means to compare. It doesn't mean that those support it. It's an indication that we can't just take this amount of evidence here and here and ignore the evidence that's in the Septuagint, the Syriac, and the Vulgate. So let's take a look at some of that and see what we can find. First of all, some 7 to 15 medieval Hebrew manuscripts and various citations of medieval rabbinic literature have 
Well, Hamashim and 50 compare the Septuagint, the Syriac, and the Vulgate. That's what the textual critical apparatus says. That's the type of translation you would give me in paper number three. Now, let's look at the Septuagint. When we look at the Septuagint, this is Rolf's edition of the Septuagint. And he has here, Hebdamekanta Andras, Kai Pentekanta Kiliadas Andron. So first of all, we have Hebdamekanta, 70 men, Andras, and here we have 50,000 men. And we have an and. 70 men and 50,000 men. Why would there be an and in the Greek? What would be the reasons for having and in the Greek? And the version of the Hebrew that they copied from. Okay, there's one option. They could have had a Hebrew copy, like one of those 7 to 15 medieval Hebrew manuscripts. They may have had a much earlier one that had a wow in it. That's one possibility. What's another possibility? A mistake. A mistake, number two. What else? They made an interpretive decision. They made an interpretive or translator's decision. That in Greek, it is more natural to use an and when you say the numbers and not to have a uh, lack of the conjunction. We do the same thing in English, right? We would say 50,070. We'd have to reverse the number to say it properly in English. Or we'd have to say 70 and 50,000. And so it could be nothing more than a translational decision that is totally unrelated to the text. But it does show something. It shows that as far as Rolf's Septuagint is concerned, the text has in it 50,070, not just 70. Now, is that adequate? No, that is not adequate. That is just looking at an addition, an addition by one man. It maintained the Hebrew duplicate noun, ish, ish, with andras and andron. The conjunction is there, but not in the Hebrew text. But we have to go somewhere else. We have to find out. You see, we have to do textual criticism of the Septuagint. Because if we're going to use the Septuagint as evidence for changing the Hebrew text, how do we know the Septuagint text we're accepting has support? Right? Why are we doing textual criticism of the, of the Hebrew Bible? To find out if there's adequate support for reading. Well, we're just automatically going to accept one man's opinion on what the Septuagint says without checking? Absolutely not. You see, if we're going to do textual criticism of the Old Testament, we also have to do textual criticism of the Septuagint. We have to do textual criticism of the Vulgate. We have to do textual criticism of the Syriac. We have to do textual criticism of the Samaritan Pentateuch. We must get down and dirty. All right? We have to get into it. We have to involve ourselves in it. We have to immerse ourselves in it. We have to find out if the additions we have have adequate evidence supporting the readings that this editor is claiming. Just keep in mind what Greek editors tend to do with the New Testament. They make a decision and change the text to fit their opinion and then defend it in their textual critical apparatus. And some of them don't even give a textual critical apparatus. And Rolf's is one that gives very little textual critical apparatus for defending any of the readings he selects. So I don't know about you, but I'm not going to trust that. I'm going to double check it. So you go to the Cambridge Septuagint and look at the textual critical apparatus. Now we've got material to work with, right? That's what you've got to do. You've got to go and you've got to find the material. You've got to find what is there and what do we find when we compare it. Here underlined in red, I think that's it right there, all right? There we have underlined in red all the different readings. And as we go down through, all the way from Hebdamekanta, all the way to Andron, the full 50,070, we have one manuscript in one scribe's hand that has Kiliadas. And the reason this is put in here like that, notice we have Kiliadas up here, but the Kiliadas down here, according to this, is a difference in order because it has Kiliadas Andron Kai changes it around. We have another manuscript here, a small, minuscule manuscript, Andron Kiliadas, instead of Kiliadas Andron, Pentekanta Kai Hebdamekanta. Uh, 
This is 50,000 still. And 70, notice the word order has changed into English word order, so to speak. 50,000, 70 instead of 70, 50,000. And then we have a number 44 manuscript. And then we have quinquaginta milia et septuaginta viros. And that Latin in here is saying exactly the same thing. 50,000, 70 men. But this Latin is the way the editors are translating the old Arabic and the old Ethiopic. So now we find out that the oldest Ethiopic and Arabic manuscripts available have 50,070, not just most of the manuscripts of the Greek Septuagint and most of the manuscripts of the medieval Hebrew manuscripts. Hebda Mekenta 70 has an ace put before it in uh, uh, one man's edition of the Septuagint. And then one has it after Andras, or actually two have it after Andras, the so C manuscript and X manuscript. The Chi is omitted in the original hand of text 3 and in text 246. But that means there are only two of the many Septuagint manuscripts that omit the Chi. Which kind of leads to you to think, especially since the Hebrew manuscripts are overwhelming the other way, that it must be a translational thing. That the Chi is there just because of Greek, not because of what's in the Hebrew. And then you have 50,000 men, and it's changed to 5,000 in C and X. So we have two minuscules that do change the number to 5,070. So far, that's the biggest change we've seen. Then here, Kiliadas Andron is Andron, and then some have Ho and some have Hos. Kiliadas ek to Lau in the one hand of a B manuscript, and out of the people being used by another. You go through all of this, all the Septuagint evidence, it's even heavier in support of what we have in the Hebrew text than what the medieval Hebrew manuscripts are. There is so little evidence against the reading of 50,070 that it, that's the reason why Rolfs doesn't even bother to even have a note there. Because in the Septuagint manuscripts, all of them are overwhelmingly in support of what we have in the Masoretic text. So let's go to the Syriac Peshitta and take a look at it. And gentlemen, if you want to get into this area, you need to learn some of the Syriac as well. And here we have Chemeshe. Chemeshe Elafin Ushivain Givrin. 50,070 men. You can take my word for it. <laughs> All right? And you look at this text, and it's the same. It has an altered order of the Hebrew, but it's given it in the natural order of Syriac. What about the Syriac manuscripts? The Peshitta Institute has produced a textual critical apparatus of the Peshitta text. I have it in my office for, first, for the books of 1 Samuel, and there are no evidences or no manuscripts that read any differently than 50,070 men. And notice what happened. You have altered order of the Hebrew. Instead of 70, 50. 70 men, 50,000 men. You have instead 50,070 men. Not a repeat of men. And uh, you have a conjunction used. And the duplicate noun is left out. It's very clear what they understood it to be. From 100 AD to 400 AD. In the first Christian translation of the Hebrew Bible into Syriac. Started in 100 AD. They added Maria, uh, Lord, as needed in the text uh, where it used to have a pronoun. Let's go to the Vulgate. In the Latin Vulgate, et percusset de populo septuaginta viros et quinquaginta milia plebis. So what do we have here? We have the same thing. 70 men and 50,000 people maintained the Hebrew duplicate noun, but not with identical nouns. They use viros, men, and plebis, people. But that's very close to what we have in the context because it talks about God smiting 50,000 men among the people and that he smote the people. And so the translator here, has, and by the way, what we would need to do on the Vulgate, same thing we did with the Septuagint. We'd have to go find all the manuscripts. We have one of the oldest 
Jerome manuscripts of the, Sept of the uh, Vulgate in our library in a copy that is, uh, it costs us about, I think, $10,000 to get hold of. It may have cost even more than that. You have to ask Dr. Swanson. And someone helped donate the money to get it. But it, it, it is a replica. It is an exact copy reproduction of Codex uh, Amiantinus that was produced in Ireland in the 7th century AD. And that is way before the Reformation. So it's not the post-Reformation or counter-Reformation Vulgate. It is the Jerome Vulgate. And it's the entire Bible from Genesis through the book Revelation. And it has a lot of things that we got that so that our doctoral students would have the opportunity to do some research in that if they are, have topics that might involve the use of that manuscript. But Codex Amiantinus is fascinating. One of the fascinating things about it, it appears in the heading to Psalm 23 to give as it tends to, this manuscript tends to reinterpret and apply the Psalms to the church of the 7th century AD in Ireland. And so the headings are not what you find in the psalm headings. You have those, but you have additional headings. Like, for example, in your Bibles where you have headings put there for literary headings. Like someone says, uh, Jesus feeding the 5,000. Just a topical heading. It's not part of the text, right? We added it in. Well, this Bible added in headings like that. And at the beginning of Psalm 23, it appears that it says, Before the rapture of the church. So try to tell me that it was some Irvingite in 18th, 19th century England who invented the rapture. How in the world did someone in the 7th century AD in Ireland figure it out? You see? Of course, all you have to do is, is go back and read some of the materials on the rapture that uh, was produced by James Stitzinger uh, that go clear back to the early church fathers to demonstrate that there's early church father evidence for the rapture as well. So it's not some recent thing. So don't just discard it because you think it's only a recent thought of the church or an afterthought of the church. It deserves more serious study than that before you decide you want to reject it. Now, this Codex Amiantinus, I said, appears to say that. But there is an alternative way to look at it. And the same word in Latin can be translated in the right context as harassing. So what do we need done? We need someone to do a master's thesis on the psalm subject headings in Codex Amiantinus that describes the history of the scribes of that manuscript and their theology as exhibited in those headings. Because it'd take a full comparison like that to really try to reach a conclusion that could be depended upon. There's a topic for you, man. You interested in church history? Interested in theology? I got sidetracked here. <laughs> All right. <coughs> Employed a conjunction. But really we need, in all of this, we need to do all the textual analysis. We would need to look at all the Latin manuscripts we could get hold of. We would need to look and see what the evidence is. But really what it comes down to in this particular case is that there is no argument from textual criticism and from the text itself to read other than 50,070 men. Even if you check out the grammar of Hebrew numerals and how it's used throughout scripture, you'll still end up supporting this reading the way everyone else has supported it as 50,070. Those who reduce it to 70 have no evidence to read it that way. You say, but what do you do with the fact that there's only... <laughs> Man, there's only 25,000 people total in Beit Shemesh. Answer that for me, will you? You know, gentlemen, there's more than one way to answer a problem like that. What about just studying the entire Old Testament? How many times did God bring plagues upon his people? And how many thousands died in those plagues? And why did they die? Because of the acts of a very few men sometimes. They were like the straw that broke the camel's back and suddenly the fury of God breaks forth and devours tens of thousands of people. Nowhere are we told here that all 50,070 lived at Beit Shemesh. We're told the men of Beit Shemesh looked into the ark. 
And obviously they were among those who died. But when we read about the plagues in Scripture, they begin in one locality because of one group of people that do something wrong, and it spreads sometimes to the entire nation. David conducts a sense of the people irresponsibly. A plague begins and spreads to the land, and over 24,000 people die in a very short period of time. Why is this said 70 men and 50,000 men? My personal opinion, I believe there were 70 men at Beit Shemesh who looked into the ark. And they are listed first as among the first to die. And then 50,000 more die throughout the land of Israel. Why? Because the men of Beit Shemesh and their disobedience are merely doing what all the people of Israel are doing. And God said that's enough. Parallel studies of other similar plagues and God's judgment among Israel in the Old Testament will demonstrate quite conclusively that that is an adequate scenario of what actually occurred. And that it could really have been 50,070 men. You see, you don't have to change the text. Sometimes we just have to back off and take a look at the text as a whole. And look at how plagues are handled and, and what caused them and how they come about throughout all the Old Testament. And then come back and take a new look at the text. And look at it theologically and contextually rather than textually. And we find the answer is very simple and very logical. And I would challenge you, you go back and read some of the older theologians and scholars like Calvin and Luther and others and the old commentaries and the early church father commentaries on this text in Samuel and you'll find that they did not think there were 50,070 people at Beit Shemesh. That many of them actually said this must be a judgment on all the Israelites. And so from the beginning, there's been a very common sense reading this text rather than an overreaction. And then because of our ignorance or overreading of the text, then insisting that we alter the text on the foundation of our own ignorance. And that's something we have to avoid. Don't ever change the text on the basis of our ignorance. That's how we get into trouble.